All right, headphones are on. And uh, good evening and welcome to the show. Now, the under-23s are heavy at work uh, in Egypt. They're trying to make sure that they get through to the Olympic Games. It didn't quite go well for them a couple of days ago, simply because they were not able to do the deed against the host nation, uh, the Egyptians at the Cairo International Stadium. So what does this mean? It means that they have to go and play the third and fourth place playoff and get a victory against Ghana. Why? They want to go to the Olympic Games. Yes, of course they do. We're looking forward to the game against the Ghana tomorrow, uh, a cup final for us in terms of uh, our aspirations to go to Tokyo. And uh, what led to the defeat, the real defeat. And uh, the boys realized that actually the mistakes uh, really led to the three goals of Egypt. Other than that, everything was going on track in terms of our game plan. Um, so we're looking forward to the game uh, against uh, Ghana. Uh, we look to sharpen our attack and make sure that uh, we take the game to Ghana, make a lot more box entries, uh, play with a little bit more width and try to use the aerial uh, uh, advantage that we'd have with a player like uh, Lyle Foster and the technical abilities of players like uh, Luda Singh, you know, just to mention a few. And uh, of course, refresh, uh, freshen up the team a little bit to make sure that we really play with high energy in this game. Uh, qualifying for the Olympics uh, for us is very, very important. It's very, very important for Safa's vision 2022. It's very, very important for the future of Bafana Fana for these players. And they are aware of this. Uh, of course, the big dream for us was to come and win AFCON. Uh, that dream has been taken uh, from us in dramatic fashion. So now we have only one thing left uh, in front of us, which is to qualify for the Olympics and go represent South Africa in the Olympics. For me personally, uh, it's been a, a humbling journey to work with these talented young boys at various age groups, under 20, now under 23. And uh, of course, to qualify for the Olympics will mean that uh, I also fall into the special group of coaches that have qualified uh, South Africa to the Olympics, namely Coach uh, Sheikh Mashaba, Coach uh, Owen Dagama, my predecessors, and I would like to join that uh, line of uh, people who've achieved uh, something for South Africa and put South Africa on the world stage. And uh, at the Olympics, uh, we'll do uh, probably and hopefully one better by going into the next round and as far as, far as possible uh, at the Olympics. But at the moment, we have to pay for our ticket. Uh, without a card that bounces. Uh, so we have to cash in tomorrow by beating Ghana and qualify for the Olympics. Uh, we appreciate the support of all South Africans, football lovers. We know there's a lot of people that are rallying behind the team and we really, really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity and the support to be on your platform. God bless South Africa with a victory tomorrow. Thank you. If you throw your mind back to one of the greatest goalkeepers South Africa has ever had, and especially at the under-23 level. Name them. Exactly. He was the first one you mentioned. He's right here on the couch. Emil Baron, good to see you. Hi, Marar. How are you? Are you strong? Uh, strong as can be. What does it mean to try go to the Olympic Games? They're these guys playing their hearts out there, trying to get to the Olympic Games. What does it mean to be in the Olympic Games? Oh, I can't, I can't express how, how it felt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the best was uh, the day we qualified against New Zealand, the second leg. Right. I think that was the best feeling, uh, qualifying. But once we were there, it wasn't as as good as it was qualifying. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, I know it's the best feeling because we've prepared for so long to qualify for the Olympics. So to reach that goal was, was uh, very... It was a huge feeling. milestone. And of course, beating yeah. New Zealand, you guys thought you were playing the All Blacks. <laughs> yeah, and they came out with the Haka as well. So yeah, yeah, but it didn't intimidate us. So we knew what we had to do, and we done it on the day. All right. Now I want to I want to remind the viewers, anyone that's watching the show, just a couple of names, and we clipped uh, you know something from Twitter that had all the names. They were just reminding us of all the great names that formed part and parcel of some of the great squads that you were a part of here. Yeah. Now, I look at these names, and I was saying to your fair, this is Sydney 2000 Olympics at the Bruce Stadium, South Africa playing against Japan, 14th of September. You had the great Mbazo, Aaron Mugwena, then, of course, Fabian McCarthy, Nkipiteni Matombo, Matthew Booth, yourself, Emil Baron, Abram Deo, 
Siabonga Belenomvet, who went to become the top goal scorer at under-23 level, David Kaname, Daron Buckley, who then went to play in the Bundesliga, Quinton Fortune, Manchester United, hey, Benny McCarthy. You, you tell me, what, what does this do to you when you hear all of these names? Oh, it's, it brings back uh, good memories. You know, uh, like I said, um, the team has been together for a long time. Yeah. So uh, we became good friends, not just teammates. We became like good friends. And I think that is also what uh, helped us through all the qualifying uh, games. Because we could understand each other, we knew uh, each other's strengths mm. on and off the field. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the, the bond that the, the team had was, uh, you know, the gel together was a very good bond. Now, that game against Japan, yeah. what stood out for you? Um, it's very negative, but I, I just remember the two goals against me. For sure. Yeah, um, I was actually disappointed with the one goal because I should have done better. I can remember like it, is, like it was yesterday yeah. on the near post. But um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, our first match in the Olympic Games um, and they had this striker that they were raving about, uh, Nakata. Yes. And, you know, so we knew it was going to be a tough game, but um, just that, that uh, the vibe we had, that it was our first game, you know, in the Olympics. Mm. I don't know, maybe we were a bit stage fright, but uh, we got into it and... Um, yeah, it was uh, good memories for me in the match. Talk about memories, though. Now, there's one thing when it comes to football players, and please share with us uh, some of your fond memories about what they used to call Amat Luk Luk. You know, that was a famous name <clears throat> uh, that they gave this under-23 team as Amat Luk Luk. Hey, all little kids aspiring to become Bafana Bafana players as well. Who were some of your favorites? Who are the players that made it happen for you? I, I know Ace Mbutu at some stage came through. Uh, Lebo Kukam at some stage also came through. Um, there were so many players that really made that under-23 team uh, something to marvel at and to look forward to. But let's quickly fast forward. Now, with every superstar, with everybody that goes through, you went to Lillstrom, right? Yes, in Norway, yeah. In Norway. Yeah. Now, playing in Norway, one of the first few players to have ventured through to play in Europe. What is that experience like? What did it fundamentally change about Emil Baron, the person that you were then? Um, yeah, I mean, before I left uh, to go to Norway, yeah. I was playing at Hellenic and I was so uh, aged, 19 years old. So uh, I'm not sure if you can remember, yeah. but I was tagged bad boy. Of, yes. Yeah. Bad boy of the game. Yes, because I would skip trainings and things like that because yeah. of yeah, uh, ill discipline. But uh, oh, once I was in Norway, um, I sort of matured more mm. as as a person and as a goalkeeper. Um, on the field, um, it helped my my game. The, with the crosses. Right. It really helped me a lot in my game because the Norwegians are quite big guys, mm. quite strong guys. And with every cross I went and went for, I would end up on the floor. So, you know, I had to become tougher with that. I was working very hard with that. And that improved me with, uh, with my goalkeeping. But then what about the bad boy point? Because you can't get on a plane and somewhere in the clouds, you stop being a bad boy. No, it didn't happen overnight because yeah. uh, there was a few experiences that happened in Norway, in Norway as well, with uh, you know, missing training, skipping training, yeah. and things like that. But um, I'll say, like after the first, after the first season, second season, it became more. Uh, how can I say? Um, you know, the discipline became better. Yeah. But w what was it about you becoming this bad boy? What was it about? The, the, the star that you're becoming, like you're a part of Hellenic from a very young age, you're 16 years old, you're yeah. a teenager, you make your debut, everybody looks at this teenager and says, wow, what a great guy, what a brilliant goalkeeper. What was it about you and, and the tag being attached to your name? Mm, I don't know, I guess it was just the, the nightlife that mm. was the problem because, you know, when I was growing up, I wasn't, you know, able to, you know, the family didn't have a lot of money. Right. So obviously now, at this young age, coming into some money, you know, you start spoiling your friends and, you know, start getting friends that you never had and yeah. start becoming, you know, bad influences. 
Um, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, because now so you, your circle of friends is getting bigger? Yeah. Uh, your popularity is getting bigger. Yes. You, you're the shining star. Mm. I mean, I know you're married now, but I'm sure hey, the chicks are out there checking you out because you've, you're carrying the big wallet and the big bags of money. Yeah. When you look back to that stage and when you look back to that time, yeah. does it ever worry you or shock you that, my goodness, was that actually me who was either doing that, spending so much, or just being careless or carefree? like that does it ever shock you when you look back yeah obviously because um you know what i know now yeah and you would then it would have been a different story um you know you know these days when you come to realize you start appreciating what you have you know at that time you didn't really appreciate what you have mm. because uh basically it was coming to you easily you understand mm. so now once you start having to work with all these things you start appreciating it more but back then it was more of, you know, everything comes easy. So, mm. you know, just never mind it, just go with it and that's it. And there's nobody to pull you back. I mean, none of your so-called friends say, hey, Emil, slow down. In, in, instead, before a game, they'll probably say, hey, hey, here, hoi one, have a, a quick one. You, you will feel much better on the field. I'm sure that's what they would be doing. Yeah, as opposed to say, hey, hey, you got a big game coming up. Yeah. And... They always used to boost my ego to say, oh, you can handle it. Yeah. You know, you, you, ah, you're, you're a big man, you can handle it. Yeah. So come, let's just go and do it. Yeah. And obviously, don't want to be, you know, seem like, a, you know, a, a softy or softy something. Softy or, yeah. yeah. So obviously, you can just go ahead and join them and do it. That's a difficult question. But you're retired now and you're talking to me. So these things don't really matter. Do you remember a game of you got to a match? And you're probably standing there as you normally do before a game. Hey, but you could feel that, yes, sir, you are finished. You know, whatever you were drinking the night before is still <laughs> zooming in your system and you're thinking, who am I playing against? And you, <laughs> did you, do you get that sense though? I mean, if you had to be open about it. Yeah, I can remember one match uh, with Hellenic. Uh, we flew uh, to play against I think it was Kwakwa Stars. Yes. Yeah, at uh, Putichichaba. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to the airport, but I got there late. Um, not so bad at all. Yeah. Got on the plane, slept on the plane, got to the stadium. First thing I did was cold shower. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't work though. But still, I went, I went on the pitch, played. Uh, first goal came in. Mm. Yeah. I stood next to the next to the near post from a tight angle, and the ball just squeezed through me. Yes. And you know, I, I I really don't know how the ball went in mm. because you know it should be like an easy catch, but the ball went in. Half time, I told the coach, "Please, I, I can't. I feel sick." Mm. Yeah. And did he take you off? Oh no. 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 He said you're going to finish the match, and when we get when we get back uh, into into uh, at the club, you will receive your fine and. You go for DC and that's it, but you are going to finish this match first. So the coach wanted more goals? Probably yeah. against, yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know what was his plan. He probably, he probably wanted to go to a new club or something, but... <laughs> so what was the final score? I think it was 4-0. No. 4-0? No. Yeah. My goodness. And for, for the life of me, I can't remember other three goals. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is incredible. And, and that forms part of the journey that we're going to talk about yeah. with Emil Biron. I mean, he, he's decided to come out, talk about all sorts of things that would have happened uh, in his illustrious career. There were some incredible highs, believe it or not. But then when the lows were low, they were just below low. And we'll talk about what he's recently had to go through because he's had some intensive operation that he's had to have. Like, now, now, now. He went to remove his stitches just the other day, uh, but he'll take us through all of that. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were saying, you know, one of your greatest players, Thierry Henry, I think we all remember him because he scored his first international goal against South Africa when South Africa played uh, in the World Cup uh, back in France in 1998, etc. So we'll remember him. Not in a good way. I think what he did to Willem Jackson, yo, I <laughs> no, let's forget about that. <laughs> but let's zoom into the fact that having not been working. He wants to get back into this thing called football. And of course, he was unveiled again this week. Let's find out what's been happening with him.
you know, sometimes you start well, sometimes you don't. Uh, I had a great experience with uh, uh, Belgium. I know I wasn't a head coach. Uh, not so great experience with uh, uh, Monaco, although I learned. Uh, very important. That's why I think you learn the most by the when you find out a lot about yourself in, in, in tough situations. This is a story, not only my story, it's a story of everybody in life. You know, you're going to fall, like I said before, but it's how you get up. And learning from your mistake, learning from what happened, then not coming back for me is the only mistake that you can have, uh, and so on. So, you know, not scared, being, a, being, being here, uh, trying to put, and put sorry, a philosophy and identity to the club is very important that the fans can identify. Uh, at the end of the day, fans want to see people caring about where they are and caring about the club that they play for. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try to put into that team uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the style that I like is, you know, very in your face, very direct, uh, trying to put pressure and play out from the back, but also having a plan B because this league is ruthless at times. All right, uh, that's uh, Thierry Henry. His journey does continue and we wish him the best of luck. Hopefully things uh, turn out slightly better. It's a different kind of appointment to what he had when he was over in Monaco. Looking at a lot of your tweets that are coming through, I think some people are just excited to see Emil Baron back again on your screens, on your devices, wherever you are watching this broadcast around the world. And we are equally as excited as well. Uh, we've got Uskumbuzo here calling, uh, well, I'll say tweeting here. Wanted to know if he can call, but we said, no, we don't have a number for callers. Uh, we'll arrange that next time. Uh, but saying, great to see Emil uh, again. Maybe just remind him of his time uh, that he had at Kaiser Chiefs, the role that Reina Dikeleke would have played uh, in shaping the kind of goalkeeper that he, he became. And obviously, uh, you know, he was a major part as a goalkeeper coach. Mm. Eh? What role did he play? He played a huge, huge role. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, like they say, German precision. You know, he had a certain uh, exercise mm. to improve every aspect of goalkeeping. Mm. And he was very precise with everything he does. And uh, also disciplined, he instilled the discipline into all the goalkeepers at the club. Um, very good guy. Mm. Very nice person. Um, he was at my wedding as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, he was dancing with my mother-in-law. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, he did have a very big impact in my goalkeeping career. Uh, I mean, th this was taken much earlier this year from another tweet as well, saying Reina Dikilek as well as his boys, uh, Ronwin as well, Rowan Fernandez as yeah. well as Emil Baron. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at that picture, hey? Memories? Yeah, I know lots of memories. Fans, the oh. badge of Kaiser Chiefs. Yeah, I can tell you, I uh, always love the Derby. Yes. The Derby, I always remember. If, if I think of Kaiser Chiefs, I always think of the Derby. Um, every Derby I've played, Pirates hasn't scored against me, so. Pirates has not scored? No. So I was, um, I'm very happy to, to have a clean sheet in every Derby I've played for Chiefs. And he would have been a disciplinarian though. I mean, he wouldn't be mm. there taking all of Emil's nonsense, surely. No, 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 that, no, he hasn't. And uh, like I said, that is why he had such a big impact, even yeah. like off the field as well. Because uh, he was very much kind of like a sort of father figure as well. Right. Because he would come, you'd, if he could see if there was something wrong with you, he'll come and speak to you. If it's not about football or about football, anything. And um, yeah, I mean, the impact he had on my yeah. life actually was immense. All right, you, you're going absolutely nowhere. We've got you locked down here. Uh, you're a prisoner for, for today. Uh, right, you're Thursday Night Live. All right, any questions that you do have for Emil, please go right ahead. You know the hashtag TNL. It is a Thursday today. And uh, we look back at his life and his career. And things do take a bit of a turn, though, because with every single player, you always hope and pray that you're not a victim of any major injury. And unfortunately for him, that prayer was not to be answered because things were to change pretty drastically. Don't go away.
All right, good to have you back again on the show tonight. Now, as you know, it's been a, an international break for a couple of days the past week or so. Bafana Bafana have been in action. Uh, things didn't go quite well when they played against uh, Ghana. It was a straight-on defeat. Uh, they were able to hold their hands up defensively. That was shocking. They had to make the changes uh, in the game at the Orlando Stadium when they went on to play against uh, Sudan. But there again, it was missed opportunities. Couldn't convert as much as they wanted to. But hey, it's all about the result. Could have counted about, what, four, five goals in that first uh, 45 minutes. Let's find out, though, from our Cape Town uh, correspondent. That's uh, Gershwan Kutsia, who managed to catch up with another legend, Eris Burton. Well, Rob, as you said, Bafana Bafana's AFCON 2021 campaign is back on track following their win over Sudan. Uh, joining us right on Marawa TV is Edris Burton, former Bafana Bafana defender, also a performer professional and now also a football analyst. Uh, Edris, the win over Sudan was a must for Mulef Nseki and his charges because if they didn't beat Sudan after yeah. failing against Ghana, it would have put them under pressure. Without a doubt, Gershwin, I think um, the, the three points was, was a must, especially at home. Um, I think we made a little bit of heavy weather from it, but, you know, the three points was, was, was an absolute must. To play in Ghana, you've been there before, playing yeah. in Africa. Yeah. It is never easy. To lose there, they could have at least yeah. have got a point out of that. Unfortunately, Bradley Hroblad, um had an opportunity to score. He didn't take his chance. Um, what pressure did that put on the team? Without a doubt, I think uh, going to Ghana, I think there was a lot of positive upbeat in the team. Um, I think we were good enough with the, with the, with the offensive players, your Percy Tao, your Bradley Grobla, your uh, Serrero. I think we were always in with a shot that possibly we could get a result. And I think we were good enough, even if it is a draw, to get a draw from, from that, that, that game. But in saying that, um, we did enough. And I think, um, you know, moments in the game changes your fortunes. And if I look at Bradley Grobla's opportunity early on in the game before we were one nil down, you know, bit of a tap in, could have got a little body over the ball. Um, but in saying that, unexpected, you would have expected him to, to really put that away. But you know what, that's how the, 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 the ball rolls. And I think we came back nicely against Sudan, put in a good performance in the first half and we, we squeezed for the, for the three points. Now for the national team, there is a break now between the next qualifiers, which is the 31st of August against mm. South Tropea away. Then it's home, Ghana home and Sudan away, can they qualify for 2021 AFCON in Cameroon? I think the next game um, is against uh, South Tropez at home. I think that's, that's another must. Um, I think they're the so-called whooping boys at this point in, in, in the group. And in saying that, on the, on the flip side, Ghana will be playing Sudan. So hopefully Ghana can, can beat Sudan. And then, you know, we've got to pick up the points against, or worst case, draw against uh, Sudan in, in, in Sudan. Um, but in saying that, uh, the three points have, have set the platform for us. It's a pity that it's only uh, that it's nine, almost nine, eight months away for our next game. And then but it's PSL preparation time, pre-season. Pre-season coming up. That's what I was going to mention now as well. So our players are going to be a little bit on the back back foot when it comes to that um, for the for that match. But you know what? We've got the quality, Gershwin, and I think we should we should be good enough to get three points. What changes would you make in the squad currently? At this point, I think uh, he's, he's got the set squad of, 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 of players. Uh, it's going to be key. I wouldn't, at this point, if you'd asked me today, I wouldn't make a lot of changes at, at this point. But in saying that, we, we're eight months away from, from that fixture, almost uh, Gershwin. So players can lose form, players can get injured. So that's going to be tough. And I think uh, he's the coach in Tseke's job is going to be to make sure that, that, that the, the players stay in, in, in good shape, especially because it's pre-season for us leading up to that particular game. Now, before I let Edris Burton go, Benny McCarthy, mm. he's left South Africa. Lots of talk that he could be linked to a national team position. Where do you see him fitting in in the national team? I think um, Benny would be good enough and his type of character and his type of personality in any football coaching uh, position at this point. And I think if there's nothing that comes up from him, I know he's gone back home, um, but I would love to see him stay involved. And if there's an opportunity in, in, in the national team, who better? Your top goal scorer for the national team. Uh, the South African people love him. I think um, if nothing comes up on his side, I would love him to be in any capacity involved with the national team. Gershwin.
Andrews Burton, thank you so much for joining us right here on Marawa TV. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Gershwin. And that is Edris Burton, former national defender, Bafana Bafana defender, and also professional, joining us right on Marawa TV. And next time, it's back to you, Rob. All right, great stuff. Uh, Gershwin Kutsi, Edris Burton, thank you so much indeed for that uh, wrap-up as far as Bafana Bafana is concerned. And some great insights. Well, interesting stuff they've said about uh, Benny McCarthy. I think a lot of people were hoping somewhere, somehow, that his good old friend, Jose Mourinho, might just give him a call and say, hey, you helped me win in Porto, the UEFA Champions League. Hey, I'm the new man at Tottenham Hotspur. Hey, come through, man. Come be my assistant coach. Hey, wouldn't that be nice? It'd be lovely for him, isn't it? No, he's, he's jobless right now. He's just been fired. Yeah. And the fired one has been employed now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it would be a good move for him if he can do that. That would be a nice reunion. I'm telling you. I mean, I know he's chosen his technical team already. But to help him sweat less, you can see he's sweating there. But just to help him sweat less, he would need somebody like that, a winner, somebody who knows how to work with the Harry Canes and the Ericsons of this world and uh, bring out the best because, hey, they've they not been playing well, Tottenham. What, what did you make of that Mourinho appointment? Um, uh, to be honest, I haven't been following the yeah. Premier League tour so much, but um, from past, uh, I know that Mourinho is a good coach. Right. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, you will only be putting positive into the Tottenham. Yeah. Tottenham well, he's a winner, that guy. I mean, he, yeah. he really, really believes in winning trophies. And if it is about winning trophies, that is something that Tottenham Hotspur have not been able to do. That's what Pochettino was not able to bring in his tenure as a coach over there. But then let's find out from the fans, though, the actual true fans of Spurs. What are their thoughts? You know, our form has been terrible for the last year now, you know, it's relegation form and the way it's going, we could generally get relegated. We're all a little bit disappointed um, in a way because he's, Pop's given us nights that we'll never ever forget. Pochettino will always be welcomed down this club by the fans, the fans love him. I always thought he was going to go because he wasn't, that, I don't think he was that happy. He's been saying for a couple of months, uh, slight little remarks that he's on his way, didn't he? Um, honestly speaking, I think he was the right guy for the job. Uh, I suppose we've been uh, disappointing so far this season, but uh, honestly speaking, um, I don't think there's anyone else to take Spurs forward, but what more can we do? Pochettino served them well, um, but Mourinho might shake it up a bit. He's, he's got the track record, hasn't he? He's, he's done it. He's done it with Chelsea, Porto. Well, he wasn't that great at Man United, but he, he, he wins stuff. We'll get there. You know, he's got a pedigree, he's won a few trophies but uh, he's been sacked at a few clubs for a uh, reason, so I'm just hoping it doesn't happen at Spurs also. Well, I'm happy who the new manager is, yeah. Yeah, as long as he keeps Kane at, at Tottenham. I don't support the board or the players or the manager, I support Tottenham Oxford. We just, we just didn't have that extra yard to win the trophy, and under Mourinho, you're guaranteed trophies, really, you know? Uh, he might get Messi to come, you never know. <laughs> We we'll, we'll get a trophy within a couple of years. If the first trophy will be back with us, yeah. And the league within three years. <laughs> All right, very confident indeed. I mean, you could tell the other gentleman just looked like, oh, he's, he's so surprised. What's this Mourinho doing here? Well, he's pinching themselves. Is he really here? You know, a big, big superstar coach as well. All right, Emil Beran still here. Lots of your tweets are coming through. Uh, just asking about what I was going to ask him about. But Vez Vitz. Whose idea was it for you to join them? Oh, well, um, after winning the league with Supersport. Right. Um, because I only had a one-year contract with Supersport. So I was uh, clubless. Mm. And then I just approached the Roger de because he was the coach at that time. And he invited me to come and just train with the team and he didn't promise anything. Mm. He said, uh, I'll have a look and if he's impressed, then you know, he'll, he'll sign me up. Um, and it, I think that after three weeks training with the team and then they offered me a contract. Was he happy though? I mean, th this is a coach who's a goalkeeper. So he would know everything about goalkeeping in terms of what he needed from you. Yeah. Was he happy with how you were playing? Uh, I should think so. Yeah. Um, it didn't help getting injured in the first match of the league, but um, you know, it happens. Um, but I came back and then, yeah, he was quite happy. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't happy to see him go yeah. uh, from from Vets because I mean he's been there for a long time sure. and so. But uh, maybe it was should have happened because you know change change in the club. 
uh, they wanted to to start winning things. So, um, yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, that, they actually gave me a lifeline, but mm. because you know I was jobless and everything, and they weren't sure that I was. I really wanted to sign with them because I had to obviously take a huge pay cut from SuperSport United. But um, you know, I was happy playing there, um, uh, and I um, was quite uh, grateful that they actually signed me on there. So outside of the injury, and, and, and we've got to trace it back. Now, the injury happened in one of the major games that uh, you had. Yeah, it was a league match against uh, Orlando Pirates yes. at Mbombela Stadium. So did you immediately feel that there was something that warranted you to leave the field? Did you carry on playing? What exactly happened at that moment when the injury kind of came through? Well, um, when it happened, yeah. I knew something's not right, and I just looked at my leg, yeah. and I saw my ankle going beside my knee, sure. and I, it, I, then I just knew that it's broken, and then all I did was, as I landed on the floor, I just tried to get my leg straight again, and just held it straight, and sat up, and immediately just called the, the doctor to yeah. come. And the doctor came on, he asked me what's wrong, I told him it's broken. You knew this immediately? I knew immediately because the ankle was right next to the knee. Oh. So I knew it was broken. And I mean, yeah. the, the worst part was that it was the 90th minute of the match. The last minute of the match and it was 0-0. Zero, zero. Oh, no. So oh, no. I mean, we're looking at uh, the x-rays that you obviously shared uh, just the other day. Uh, because we've been tracking how you've been doing as far as the operation is concerned. We, uh, we've got to thank as well Kleenex that have come through so nicely for you in in taking charge of you because there was a th there was a, a problem though because I always think that if if you get injured on duty yeah that the people that have employed you should then ensure your healing mm. and ensure that you come back and you're okay would you say Vitz played their part in your healing or trying to get better because you got injured, like you say, in the 90th minute. Yeah, well, um, like the initial operation was done, mm. uh, I think it was the 27th of April, 2013. Right. Um, since the operation, uh, you know, I've been struggling with it because it was infection and everything to that. But, um, and obviously 2013, my contract finished. Mm. So, Basically, Vitz knew for a fact that I'm going to need another operation once the bone is uh, healed, uh, healed uh, together. Mm -hmm. And um, they knew, even if I was out of contract, they knew that it was coming once it's healed. The, the, the nails had to come out of my leg. Yeah. Um, but basically, that is why they, they, they came to me and said they, they feel they should not be held responsible for, for paying for the op or mm -hmm. for anything else since that has been six years. Oh, I mean, that's terrible. Six years or not, you were not out playing golf. You were not in a nightclub and you slipped over somebody's drink. Yeah. You were on duty. Yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't even a training. Uh, it was an official match. It was official PSL match. So match. what is the problem with the fact that it was six years? Is it the duration of time between the injury and when you were then saying, but guys, you need to help me because anything could happen. I mean, you could have had your leg amputated. Yeah, well, um, because of the infection, yes. it took a, a very uh, took a long, longer time to heal. So it took a couple of years. I mean, uh, that sent me, I think it was in 2015, two years after the operation. Yeah. They sent me for an x-ray and it still hasn't, didn't... Uh, hasn't fused. Hasn't, yeah, it hasn't yeah. fused. Well, and then I went back to them uh, because in 20, uh, last year, 2018, uh, uh, had some septic arthritis in my knee. So I had to have an op done for, for, for cleaning it out. Yeah. And they told me that the reason why is because of the nail in the, in the leg. It had to be removed. And I went to Vert and they sent me to go and see the doctor who did the initial op. And he told me, no, it's ready. It can come out now. And he told me, you can do it for me in the next week, mm. just have to go back to Wurz and they just have to give the go-ahead. And that was 2018 and they just didn't... They didn't bother after no. that. 
All right, we'll pick up on that um, rather sad twist <laughs> and spin as far as that tale is concerned. And, and, and definitely, I mean, he's up and running. That's the, that's the positive that we can bring and share with you. Uh, but he'll complete that story. He'll tell us about that journey. It's an unfortunate one and maybe one that a lot of the players who are watching the show can learn from because we don't want to go through these journeys uh, so many times as well. But hey, also, Telcom Knockout happening this weekend. Right, when you talk about some of the greatest legends that have uh, come out of the African continent and gone to play uh, in some of the finer European teams, you talk about Sami Kufour. Now, Sami spent the bulk of his professional career playing at Bayern Munich. Now, Bayern Munich, he managed to lose in the UEFA Champions League final, managed to win in the UEFA Champions League final. So he got the medal. And he's been celebrated ever since. I mean, played alongside the likes of Oliver Kahn and uh, some of the other great legends of the Bayern Munich era. He'll be surprised. Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, Bayern Munich had been looking around for a coach. Now it's not going to be Sammy coaching. But he's just celebrated his birthday. And he's also just unveiled a little mini statuette of his mom. Sadly passed away uh, as well last year. And uh, he had a very close affinity and relationship with his mother. And as part of the celebration, I mean, <laughs> Sami Kufour decided to go to town. He went and invited some of his closest friends. He opened up the gates of his house. Yes, his house. You'll see why I make that expression to say his house. Yeah, Sami, let's join in. We sent our cameras, though, to kind of fish around and see what's happening at that birthday party. <laughs> Samuel Osei Kufour. Man, hey, Emil, you would have loved to have been at that party, hey? We were, you and I were not invited. I was talking to Samuel. This is wrong. Mm. I'm telling you, if it was about 15 years ago, I would have been there. You would have been there? I would have been there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, Sammy, happy belated birthday, my friend, and keep strong, man. Keep strong. I love the fact that uh, his success has really, really stayed on, and, uh, and why not? Yeah, as I said. Enjoying a good time there at his house. He's going to occupy maybe the security wing of his house. Just as long as I get hot water, Sammy, I'll, I'll be okay. Just invite me uh, any one of these days uh, overall. I think that's the one thing that we look forward to. Any major life regrets that you say you would have had in that journey that especially adverts and especially on how they treated you? Um, not, not really regrets. Yeah. Because... Uh, it happened while I was doing something I love and that's playing football. So I don't regret, you know, playing the match and uh, that it happened. Mm -hmm. But um, I do feel a bit, you know, uh, badly done mm -hmm. because of they know that they were, they were responsible for the medical bills and everything to, t t to turn around and come back and say they feel that they shouldn't pay for it. Um, I mean, I basically went out there and died on the field for them and after a few years this is what they do. But I mean, it's, it's life, it happens in life, you know, some people they can just chew you up and spit you out, so it happens. But is, is there no way, because ultimately there is insurance cover that comes through yeah. uh, with all the professional players that 
are liable for that. And I know that there was some cover that released some money and you got a portion of it and Bidvez Vids took their portion and also gave it to you. Yeah. But there was a bigger amount that still, as far as I know, I might be wrong, that is still outstanding. Yeah. Well, um, there were some calculations made and everything yeah. and there was a total amount that was, uh, you know, that we thought we, I was going to receive. Uh, but um, after two years, they came to me with an offer that was way less than what it should have been. Right. Yeah. So, and at that time I was, you know, deep in debt. Yeah. You know, I needed to have the money, otherwise I was going to lose my house. Um, so I just, I had to agree mm. to just settle with that amount they gave me. But it's not a, an amount that's going to sustain. You've got a family to look after. You've got two young kids. Yeah. You've got a wife to look after. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel that, you know, if they, at that time, if they had given me what I was supposed to receive, yeah. I wouldn't have been in the situation that I am. You know, I could have started up a new business. I would, I would have still had my, ho my house. I would have still had my car. You know, I would have, you know, at least still been, you know, had a, a Did you end up life. losing the house? Um, not losing the house. I actually sold it because, you know, we couldn't maintain it anymore. And, right. you know, obviously with no income, you know, the, the bonds and everything. So uh, if, if I didn't see, uh, sell the house, probably eventually I would have lost it. So I rather sold it and then just move into a smaller place. All right, uh, quickly turn our attention. We'll, we'll continue our conversation. As I said, uh, Emil Baron, you know, taking the time and opening up about all sorts of things uh, because he's kind of kept away. Eh? I had to get the police force to come in and help me here uh, uh, to try and get him out of his house <laughs> so that he could come in and chat to us here. And um, as I said, it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation, but it's, it's an important conversation to have uh, nonetheless. All right, as far as... Uh, Bundesliga is concerned. My goodness, what is going on? The top three teams, who would have thought Bayern Munich uh, would be sitting where they are? But they've got an important game coming up over the weekend. So let's get excited, though. As you know, Mara TV partnering up with the Bundesliga and a crackerjack of a match that's to come this weekend. Check it out. I'm your worst nightmare. Breathing down your neck. Sending shivers down your spine. This is Bayern München's Allianz Arena. You've been here before, determined and courageous, but I destroyed your dream. Lewandowski's there! And here you are again, fearless. Oh, superb stuff! Will you conquer me? FC Bayern München versus Bayern 04 Leverkusen. <sighs> All right. I mean, that's a tough one. I was looking at where... Uh, buy and do stand as far as the log is concerned. Mm. Yeah, they're going to need to work hard. Munchen Gladbach are having a season and a half, topping that uh, table. And uh, that's how the standings look. Uh, you know, Leipzig are in second place, uh, Freiburg, and uh, by Leverkusen, you know, lying in eighth. Who would have ever thought that Eindruck Frankfurt as well uh, would be teetering there in the, the top eight. But I mean, I'm looking forward to what Dortmund would be having over the weekend as well because uh, they get to play an important game. They're playing at home, uh, do Borussia Dortmund against uh, Paderborn. So we'll have a quick look as well of how they are preparing for that match. Defend your territory. That's the goal that Dortmund were looking for. Show them who's top dog. Another goal for Dortmund. But beware, these underdogs bite. Scooping one, oh brilliantly. Paderborn bury the first blow. This is a chance. It's a chance they have taken. Who will win control of the territory? Borussia Dortmund versus SC Paderborn 07. All right, the one that I was talking about, Leipzig. Hey, hey, Emil. Leipzig lie in second spot. I know that the likes of Hoffenheim early on in the season, they were right up amongst the top teams, but they've kind of dropped right now into fifth place. That's where Hoffenheim are. Uh, but I'm interested to find out who Leipzig are going to be playing against this weekend. And of course, they'll be playing their game at home. You've felt it all your life. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your head, driving you crazy. Still dangerous, though. Is it the real world or just a dream? Coolness and authority. Some things you just can't explain. Three, two, 
warmth. Like this Bundesliga feeling. RB Leipzig versus Erste FC Köln. Puh. All right, Bush and Gladbach are top of the table, and they do get to, to try and cement their spot, uh, sitting there with uh, 25 points, and they're really knocking on trying to get to 30 points as quickly as they can. And they've also got a crucial game coming up this weekend. Um, it's, a, it's a home fixture again. They get that advantage. Their home fans have been more than excited. They want to keep up that momentum before uh, Bayern hopefully get back on stride as well. Let's uh, quickly check who Bush and Gladbach have over the weekend. A place full of magic, energy, and hope. The Foles are nailing down top spots. Inspiring leaders of the league, fearless and proud. But beware, visiting Freiburg are always dangerous. The technique there was wonderful. They go to the limit and never give up. Get ready, there's a big game coming. Borussia Mönchengladbach versus SC Freiburg. All right, so, so Freiburg, Mitch and Lank, but uh, definitely one that we're going to be looking forward to uh, overall. You look at that uh, top of the table and certainly all spread out. And we'll keep you up to date, though, as far as Marawa TV is concerned. Um, Emil Baron here getting lots of love on social media, on Twitter. Uh, Sonia saying that, well, you know, this is one of the greatest goalkeepers that South Africa ever had. And great to see him uh, coming out and talking about his life story. Uh, really loved what he did at under 23. So, Sonia, thank you so much indeed uh, for that uh, tweet. So keep those tweets coming through. And also good luck to the under 23s who are soldiering on and uh, making sure that they get through to the Olympic Games. And that is part of what we've been talking about uh, with the meal. I think some of the players from that uh, 2000 uh, Olympic Games squad that we didn't even mention, there was a player called Mzunani Mkwigwi. Hey, remember Mzunani Mkwigwi? <laughs> mm. There was Steve Lekolea, who was part of that. There was Jabu Pule, who was part of that team. Uh, even not forgetting Dumi Sangobe. Mm. You know, Dumi, all of these guys that were there. Yeah. I mean, these are great names. You put Brian Malloy there on the bench. You played all the games at the Olympics. Mm. Yeah, Brian went with as uh, uh, one of the three overage players. Yeah, the senior boys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he kept me on my toes, so. As he should. I think that was yeah. part of the purpose. I mean, Brian was on form at that stage yeah. and sending him because that's what the Olympic Games do allow is for, for national teams and to allow a you know, certain number of three, over, uh, three over three, players. Three, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I think when people keep reminding us and you keep looking at social media like, my goodness, people still remember so many of the players and what they meant uh, to the journey overall. I talked earlier about this week and how important it was because after the operation they then obviously stitched everything up and you've had those stitches removed now yeah uh i had it removed on monday yeah yeah monday um so i just have another appointment next monday just for flesh just, uh, to uh, check the wounds but um on the 14th of december i go back into surgery just to remove the wire they left inside uh, inside my leg uh, what the wire is doing is it's just pushing out some antibiotics inside oh, okay. to kill all the bacteria and stuff that's inside. So uh, the doctor I have, um, Dr. Khahudi, mm -hmm. he really he wants to be 100% sure that he gets rid of all the infection that's in the leg. That is why he's, he's put the wire inside. Because delaying that process was always my concern. And th that's probably the wire that you had in the x-ray that we're seeing now that is still in there. And, th and that helps... No, no, that's... So they've removed that and that put another... That is the nail they've removed, That's yeah. the nail that was there. Yes. Whew. That's a lot. That's a lot of processes that are involved here, hey? Yeah. That nail obviously was important then. It played its role, was removed. Yeah. Then they had to put another one in a similar area. Yeah. And that's the one that's been helping to release the, uh, the antibiotics yes, to, as well. To yeah. kill the, the bacteria, yeah. But how are you feeling now? I mean, I was looking at you... You know, in your fancy schooner here, um, <laughs> you know, all those dancing around the studio. You, this, this is new to you. You weren't able to put on your shoes and be as... Yeah, I, I uh, could only be walking bare feet or with uh, flip-flops. Wow. Uh, because um, uh, I had a damaged nerve in my, in my leg as well. Yeah. So the feeling underneath my foot wasn't as normal, yeah. like 100%. And my toes, I couldn't move my toes. 
until recently when they removed the pin, I could start moving my toes a bit yeah. and the nerve, uh, the feeling is starting to come back. And uh, it's actually strange you're wearing these shoes again. <laughs> but it's a good feeling though. It's a good feeling, yes, well, so you, yeah. You're coming back to life. Yeah. You know, this is real return back to life for you. And, and that's what makes me happy because there's nothing that is as messed up, Emil, as you sitting in a corner mm. feeling like the world is against you. Yeah, no, uh, I admit it was, it was very tough for me the yeah. past uh, six years. Has been tough. Could have also, I blame myself because I isolated myself. Um, but I think mostly because I isolated myself was because of the depression I went into. Yeah. And the person that I am, I don't, I don't like, uh, you know, putting, uh, you know, stress on other people for help, like to help me. But that depresses you more. Yeah, I know, and I came to understand that. Yeah. So uh, I'm just happy uh, that I came out of that corner now. But um, how sure are you that you're out of that corner? Um, I am sure since since the interview we had a yeah. couple of weeks back. Right. Right. Uh, you actually put, you put a smile on my face wow. and that is when I knew I'm going out of the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Robin, I really thank you for that. And um, yeah, that is how I know that yeah. the, the darkness is at the back and the light is in front. Beautiful. Love that. Love that. Um, I think the, the bigger part of life, Emil, I'll say this to you free of charge, is that we have a purpose to serve. You've served your purpose as far as the football is concerned. You've served your passion as far as football is concerned. You've entertained many households as far as pushing your passion forward. And it doesn't mean that now that football is over, your life must be over. If there were problems that had to do with what you went through with your injury, it does not mean that your life is over. It is only just the beginning. And that is why we had to do what we had to do. If a club doesn't want to pay for your injuries or pay for your insurance, it's okay, let them keep the money, see how far they get in life. You know, life is very simple. Life deals with you at a later stage. But I think 2020, uh, it will be important. We'll go through whether it is, uh, again, seeking professional help to try and get you fully back because I'm glad to see that smile. You know, it's a smile that I would pay my last cent <laughs> to see because all that that means is that Emil Baran is coming around and is getting back into the business of life. The business of football is done as a professional. It's the business of life that he is focusing on. So yeah, I'm glad that we are part of that journey right here at Marawa TV. You're gonna take a quick break. After that, we come back and we look at, yo, oh, I look at these four teams, Telcom knockout. Will it be Arrows, Sundowns, Maddisbeck, Kids of Chiefs? I don't know, you tell me. Find out after this. Losing two matches, honestly, is not a trains match. We've probably are one of the teams that have not lost that much in the league, as it is. Uh, at a certain point in football, you must accept to lose. Barcelona loses, Liverpool loses, Man City is in crisis like us. You know, so that's football. It has got those dimensions, and at times, uh, losses bring you closer. Being without Mshishi will always be be bad for everyone because he's, he's very important to the team. He controls the tempo of the game. He, he gives you at times a false sense of uh, dominance because he makes the team to tick, but uh, it's not only Mshishi. You know, when you don't have Mshishi, you don't have Gaston and you have uh, Pagamani injured, you have Kelezo injured, then your pace and your precision in your attack is, is tempered with. So you, you have to try other means, you have to try other players and hope they can really replicate that or maybe give you a different, different dimension to, to what they give you. As it is now, we are happy with uh, our goalkeepers. Dennis has, has done very well for us. He may have made that mistake, but we know what he's capable of. We, we, we've been with him for all these years and we trust in him. Kennedy is a top goalkeeper. We are still trying to build the confidence of Riyadh to come up strong as well. He's working very hard in training. We've got another youngster that not many people know, Abraham Nobo. He's also doing very well. He's our fourth choice goalkeeper very energetic goalkeeper with a very bright future. So we, 
we, we just have to believe in, in, in whoever that is there and support. And the good thing, there is no animosity um, amongst our goalkeepers. They really support one another. All right, no animosity. That is according to the assistant coach there of Ma Melody Sundowns. That is Mangoba Ngiti. And why not? I mean, this is such an important game. It's the sixth semi-final as far as the uh, Telcom knockout is concerned overall. Uh, so Golden Arrows get to play against Mamelodi Sundowns. Uh, that's on uh, the 23rd of November. Uh, that's over the weekend. Looking forward to that. Uh, Steve Compella has been praying not to win. He's been praying for rain. <laughs> and he knows why he's been praying for rain. What happened with Dennis and Younger the last time is what he hopes to happen all over again. And uh, I don't know if those prayers are going to come true, but all I know is that Kompela has been praying for rain. And it's one of those. I mean, top goalkeeper on the African continent, you can't mess around with him. But those moments do happen, and they did happen. And unfortunately, you know, for Dennis, he'll know. But as Mangoba was saying that they've got a massive pool of uh, goalkeepers that they're looking at to build up the confidence. Uh, Riyad Pitasa being there has been one of those goalkeepers that he says they're working on his confidence. Um, you know, and of course, overall, I think uh, there's a, a goalkeeper Ngobo, who's also been there knocking on the door. He says that he's got a lot of confidence in him coming through and hopefully making uh, some form of start. Hey, you, you watch the local game a bit? I don't know when last you watched a football game. Do you have an interest still in the game? Mm, I do, but, um, you know, the kids at home, they basically just want to be watching the cartoons all the time, so I don't have time to uh, to really follow it. But yeah. I do, like, follow on the news and see the results and things like that, yeah. Who do you support? Uh, still Kaiser Chiefs, always been a Kaiser Chiefs supporter. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever go to their games live? I mean, when last were you at the stadium? Um, no, it's been a couple of years. Years? Yeah, years. Was Mandela still alive? Yes, he was. Yeah, I, th I thought as much. <laughs> I thought as much. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a very long <laughs> it's time. It's been a long time. We must get this guy back onto the, onto the field. Well, just to come and watch, you know, sit with us and the extra strong and enjoy, clap, blow over Vuzela, do whatever uh, it needs to happen there. But what about Kaiser Chiefs, though? They're going to be hitting Bombella uh, Stadium as well over the weekend. They get to play against United. Yeah, Maritzburg United. I know you don't want, not the other United. Uh, so we'll confirm that. We'll get to see what it is that they can bring onto the table there uh, to Kaiser Chiefs. Uh, they come into this game as well, uh, just like United, who are going to be without Kwanda Mgonyama, who got that red card when they played against the Orlando Pirates. Uh, Kaiser Chiefs will be out, uh, out there with Daniel Lakpe, who misses the game as well. So uh, an unfortunate turn of events there for them. Counting in Eric Mato, Willard Katsande uh, will also miss that game. But they've got such a, a huge pool of uh, players to look in and try to get them back on track as well. It's been four and a half years for Kaiser Chiefs. I know Emil doesn't know anything about not winning trophies, but four and a half years. It has been no trophies, nothing, not even a jug of water, nothing <laughs> for Kaiser <Kesa> Chiefs. <laughs> hey, <laughs> and that's something that they would want to try and rectify. Let's find out, though, because uh, we sent our cameras through uh, early this morning to Kaiser Chiefs uh, for their media day and find out what Ernest Middendorp had to say. We take them very serious in terms of our preparation, like we do with other and each and every team. It doesn't matter if we play uh, Pirates, Sundowns, uh, Polo Kwane, Black Leopards, or now Maritzburg United. We, we are not uh, going and, and take them lightly. We know we have to perform on, on a very good level. All right, they haven't won this uh, Telkom knockout since 2010, uh, have uh, Kaiser Chiefs for Maritzburg United, though, as Eric Tinkler has been saying the entire week, they would not have reached the final yet. And of course, they'll be making history if they do. And we know the fighting spirit uh, that Eric Tinkler brings across. So I don't know. I'll find out from Emil what he favors, who he thinks will get through to the final of the Telcom knockout. Yeah, they have said Moses Mabida, uh, the home of football in South Africa. Uh, they play the major finals there. Uh, so they'll be playing yet another one there. So you might as well just have a KZN dub. You have Maritzburg United playing against Golden Arrows in the final. What do you think? Yeah, but you must remember, if Chiefs gets into the final, yeah. this is Mabida is almost like a, a home home ground for Chiefs. Yeah. Because finals in Moses Mabida, Chiefs are always winning. 
Always. Always. But can they get through the semi-final? It's a slightly difficult mm. one for them if you look at it overall. Yeah. Do you think they've got what it takes? Yeah, they've, they've got what it takes. And um, like I say, if yeah. they can just get through this hurdle, yeah. they'll, they'll win the, the Telkom knockout. Do you think you would be a first-choice goalkeeper if you had to get back to Chiefs? They've been struggling a bit. At this moment? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. You won't? No. Yeah. I'll probably be coming late to training or something. Still? Probably, yeah. I thought you gave up those old habits. <laughs> hey, this guy. Hey, what kind of a human being are you? <laughs> All right. And, and I know the, the, the best goalkeeper for Kane's achieves for you in your playing time would have been who? Because Chiefs have always been blessed, man, with, mm. with great goalkeepers, mm. whether it was Botende, Scherle. Yeah. Um, before then, I know you talked about Brian, yeah. uh, the earlier days. Before then, there was Peter Balak, Joseph Banks, Claudia, you name them. They were all at kinds of Chiefs. Gary who Bailey. for you was that? Yeah, I mean, Gary Bailey, when he yeah. came back from playing at Manchester United, went straight to kinds of Chiefs. Yeah. And, you know, you remember a certain striker that scored the first goal against Gary Bailey, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> Gary will chop my head off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, who, who would you say was, the, was the, one of the greatest goalkeepers at Chiefs? Um, I would say uh, Itumel and Kune. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, while I was still playing at Chiefs, he was still with the development team, but he used to have training sessions with us, with, us, with the senior players. And I could see his potential at that time already. And, you know, Itu's got everything a goalkeeper needs. You know, he's got agility, he's got speed, you know. And the kick of his, you know, he's so accurate. How does know? he do it, though? I have no idea. <laughs> I've been trying it out all my... You know, it's just unbelievable the way he can do that. You, so you don't know? Because, I mean, Kune does this. He does these videos on, on Instagram, even, where he puts, like, bottles there and he shows mm. how he'll get the top of the bottle, not the middle or the bottom. Mm. And he gets it accurate all the time. Mm. So what is it, just a skill? Is it a gift? What, what, how? How does he manage? I mean, he's just naturally talented, you know. Uh, and unbelievably, he never used to train it much. Yes. He just used to do it. Uh, I mean, that's, he's such a, a natural talent, you know, as a goalkeeper. You know, everything is just natural to him. He's, even the way he can uh, catch the ball in the air. You know, he's so got such me, a job. Uh, help me, Emil. Please help me. I need help, you know that. Help me understand this. How come Dumoulin Kune has never had a chance to break into one of the international teams? You worked hard and you got through to Lillström in Norway and you're a goalkeeper. Yeah. Kune has been there, man, for 16 odd years uh, since he joined Kaiser Chiefs with the youth structures and everything else. How come? I mean, it's not about height, is it? No, definitely not. Um... In my experience, I think it's more about uh, you know, a bit of luck. Yes. Because that is how I got my contract overseas. It was by luck because of the side a new Swedish goalkeeper. He broke his leg. Mm -hmm. They were in South Africa on pre-season training and uh, I got a chance. So I think it's more about luck. And obviously I think uh, uh, Itu was very comfortable at Chiefs and yeah. he was happy where he was. And I mean, it all comes to, do you really want to go there? Do you want to play overseas? Or are you happy where you are? So, and I think he was happy where he is and he was enjoying his game. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that is why he's never gone overseas. All right. My final question, it's an easy question. I don't usually ask questions. I usually chat. <laughs> um, who's the worst coach that you've ever had? Worst coach? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have, have, I'll have to say uh, it was Ted Dimitri. It's just uh, when I signed for Kaiser Chiefs. Um, you know, that, that man was like a real liar. He could lie in your face. <laughs> if he didn't want you to play this weekend, he'll say, you are injured, go and see the physio. And you'll say, oh, but coach, I'm not injured. he said, no, go and see the doctor, you're injured. You're out for the weekend. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it was... He's the, the only one that comes to mind as a worst coach to me. Lies. Lies. Pure lies. <laughs> White lies. Strong champ. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob.
I'm going to tell you any lies here, guys. We're done. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Marawa TV, keep it locked. Thank <laughs> you.